Hello to everyone joining us today. So it looks like most people are filtering in, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for being here for today's discussion on Russian President Vladimir Putin's most recent nuclear threats in the context of Russia's war on Ukraine. My name is Shannon Bugis, and I am a senior policy analyst at the Arms Control Association. Before introducing our knowledgeable and accomplished panelists that we have with us here today, I would like to set the scene a little bit for their remarks and ensuing discussion with you all through the Q&A. Within days of its renewed invasion of Ukraine on February 24th, Putin changed the level of Russian nuclear forces to, quote, a special combat, a special regime of combat duty, end quote. It came to be understood that this likely meant a reinforcement of all nuclear command posts with additional personnel. Putin's February threat of nuclear use has proved to be only the start. In late April, he once again warned that Russia might employ nuclear weapons against any country that Moscow sees as intervening in the war. Some Russian officials have, at times, attempted to temper Putin's threats by emphasizing that the war in Ukraine does not fit into the four scenarios in which Moscow would consider the use of nuclear weapons as outlined in a June 2020 document. The past few weeks have unfortunately seen a significant, a significant shift in the concerning direction in the nature of Putin's nuclear threats, which has occurred alongside Russia's illegal annexation of four Ukrainian regions. In his speech on, on September 21st, Putin called for a partial mobilization and referenda in those four Ukrainian regions and warned that Moscow will consider the employment of all its available weapon systems if there is a threat to, quote, the territorial integrity of Russia. A little more than a week later, during a ceremony marking Russia's official, still illegal, annexation of those four regions, Putin emphasized that Moscow will do everything it can and use all the forces and resources at its disposal to defend Russia. These two more recent threats by Putin carry with them greater concern. The September 21st threat expands, expands the scenarios in which Russia will contemplate nuclear use, and the September 30th threat exacerbated concerns of nuclear use, as Russia confirmed that an attack by Ukraine in those four regions annexed by Russia equates to an attack on Russia. And if such an attack is viewed as a threat to Russia's territorial integrity by Moscow, then Putin may think about using nuclear weapons. Thus far, the United States has assessed no signs of imminent Russian nuclear use and no need to adjust the alert level of US nuclear forces. Last week, US President Joe Biden said that the world is facing the prospect of nuclear Armageddon for the first time since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Today, we have three experts at the ready to analyze this situation, including Putin's threats and Biden's remarks, and to share some thoughts on how world leaders might want to respond and what might be ahead. Quickly, on the logistics side of things, each speaker will have the floor for around 10 to 12 minutes. After all three have spoken, we will turn to Q&A with the audience. At any time during their remarks, if you have a question for them, please send it through the Q&A box for which there is a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I will sort through those questions and pose them to the speakers once all the remarks have finished. And FYI, the chat has been disabled because we really want your questions to go through the Q&A function instead. First up will be Hans Christensen, who is the director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. Hans will primarily speak on the types of nuclear weapons that Russia may consider for use in Ukraine, in the Ukraine conflict, and the capabilities of the United States and NATO. Second will be Rose Gottemuller, who is a senior lecturer at Stanford University's Institute for International Studies and its Center for International Security and Cooperation. Rose previously served as the Deputy Secretary General of NATO and the Chief U.S. Negotiator of the New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, known as New START. Rose will mainly focus on how the United States and NATO may or may not respond should Putin use nuclear weapons, whether tax, uh, excuse me, may use nuclear weapons, namely tactical nuclear weapons, in the war. Our third speaker is Daryl Kimball, who is the Executive Director of the Arms Control Association. Daryl will mainly discuss the potential ways in which to dissuade Putin from employing nuclear weapons in the first place. All right, I hope that helps to set the scene and it is time to hear from our speakers. Hans, you are up first. Thanks very much. Uh, I need to share my screen here. Thanks very much for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> I just thought it would be helpful just to have a few slides and Deborah's, instead of just, you know, mumbling things. Um, but um, thanks for the presentation and the introduction. Um, yes, um, 
it's somewhat depressing to put it mildly that we have to sit here and have this conversation three decades after the end of the Cold War, but, but here we are. Um, so I've been asked to give a brief overview of what uh, Russia has, um, you know, what potential uh, use scenarios that might exist, a um, little about the command and con uh, control structure, um, as well as uh, a little snapshot of what NATO, of course, also has um, in its capacity. At, and at the intro here, um, it's important to, to remind that Russia has used nuclear threats on many occasions, but of course this is unique um, because it's in the context of a large conventional war uh, in the middle of Europe where Russia is not doing well. And so that raises a host of potential uh, issues. Uh, remember, we also had threat back in 2014 with Crimea, even earlier back when the US ballistic missile defense uh, program was being considered in Europe. At that time, there were very explicit threat to several countries, including uh, Poland and Denmark. But this is, of course, unique uh, at a whole different level. Um, briefly, the, the Russian stockpile is large. Um, uh, most of it uh, is not directly relevant to this particular conflict, uh, I would say, but uh, roughly sort of 4,500 warheads in their military stockpile and more that are retired and not yet dismantled. Out of that portion, of course, um, uh, a significant number are non-strategic. Um, Russia does not disclose numbers about its non-strategic weapons. The US uh, um, estimate in public is 1,000 to 2,000 uh, warheads. That includes retired warheads as well. Um, now this estimate is specific, is significantly lower than the estimate um, the DOD referenced in 2009 during a briefing to NATO uh, where they mentioned public estimates of 3,000 to 5,000. They didn't give a classified estimate, but it seems to indicate that there's been a reduction over the last decade plus. Um, but it is still a very diverse uh, force. Um, and that obviously means that, that Russia is adhering greater importance to, we call them tactical nuclear weapons or non-strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, in the Russian category, I guess it's more uh, interesting to look to divide it up in longer range, strategic um, long range weapons versus uh, regional weapons, the shorter range weapons. Um, the point is that many of Russia's military scenarios, they, they lie in their periphery. Uh, they obviously don't have to use uh, long range strategic weapons necessarily for that. They can focus that on the, on the potential scenarios with the United States. Um, so we also assume, of course, that Russia you know, relies more on tactical nuclear weapons because its conventional forces are not um, as, as advanced. And we've seen a really a uh, significant reminder of that uh, issue here in the in the in the Ukraine war. Um, how would they use nuclear weapons, or what would they do? And the first, let, let me just say here, I don't think it's likely that Russia uses nuclear weapons in in the Ukraine crisis. For that, um, things would have to escalate significantly, in my view, to a direct clash between NATO and 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 Russia. Um, that said, they've certainly rattled the sword and, and, and threatened um, something that looks like a scenario going beyond what Russia's um, declaratory policy is, in my view. Most likely um, would be a use of an Anskanda short-range ballistic missile. Uh, most likely simply because of reliability, the fact that it's a quick strike where uh, where, where the uh, Ukrainians don't have much counter capability. They have some, but not, not much. So they would probably be the most effective way. Um, the, the, the whole process about how to get to that decision, of course, beyond whether it's smart or not, um, uh, would start with a decision by Putin. Uh, he has to make that decision. But of course, like in the United States, the military has to cooperate. Um, I, I don't think there's a red button on his desk that he can press and then suddenly the nuclear weapons start flying. Um, since strategic forces are an alert, except the bombers, um, they would obviously be able to be used very quickly or relatively quickly, but uh, that would be overreach in my view. Uh, but again, we're trying to think like rational people here who knows what would actually happen. Um, tactical nuclear weapons would take longer. Um, they're all, the warheads for those systems are in central storage and would have to be brought out of their bunkers first and uh, transported out to the launch units 
um, that would fire them. Um, so there's a number of steps in those decisions and, 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 and processes that are potentially detectable to uh, Western intelligence. And so it's probably reasonable to assume that they would be detected. Um, the effect, once they make a decision um, to, to, to do this, uh, very much depends on, of course, both the target that they're using it on, um, the yield, the height of detonation, the height of the burst. Um, and just like that, the, the fallout coming from a nuclear use would also depend on yield and height of burst, of course, importantly. The wind directions um, and precipitation. Uh, precipitation. Um, and here you can see three different quick uh, simulations to sort of help illustrate what different yields do. Um, the left is a one kiloton simulation, and I've used um, uh, you know, an air base uh, in Ukraine um, just to, or an airport in Ukraine, just so you can, you know, get a rough idea about, you know, distances and size. And so the first one to the left is a kiloton. The second one is a five kiloton. And then, of course, the 15 kiloton is roughly equivalent to the Hiroshima bomb. Um, they have a wide range of tactical nuclear weapons or any nuclear weapons yields that go from around one kiloton and up to over a hundred. Um, and so it's not, it's not that tactical nuclear weapons necessarily are only low yield. There is a wide range, but they would have to use a lot of these if they would wanna have a measurable effect on uh, the, the war itself. Um, you know, knocking out troops is not very efficient with, with nuclear weapons unless you use a lot of them. Uh, more effective, they're more effective against fixed targets, whether they be surface or, or on the ground. So those are some of the consideration, of course, for why do it. Um, they could also use sort of a simple terror attack where they try to annihilate a city, but then we're in a completely different ball game in terms of possible reactions. Um, on the other side, of course, NATO has, has also has nuclear forces, significant numbers, but importantly, NATO uh, and the United States uh, have not wanted so far to react um, with explicit nuclear counter threats. Um, that's a very important uh, and positive uh, development, I think. Um, and yet today we saw a statement by, um, by NATO Secretary uh, uh, General Stoltenberg in which he weaves uh, an upcoming NATO non-strategic nuclear weapons exercise um, and a nuclear uh, top meeting into the narrative about what NATO's position is um, on the Ukraine war and its backing of Ukraine, et cetera. Um, so this is, a, this is a new, in my view, a new way of using nuclear language uh, in, in the NATO. I don't, I'm not sure this is necessarily uh, sort of a deliberate um, change or something like that, but this struck me that I thought this was uh, different. Generally speaking, of course, the United States relies less on non-strategic nuclear weapons than, than Russia, uh, not least because it has much better conventional capabilities. It has largely moves out of non-strategic business. It does have an inventory of US nuclear weapons in Europe, uh, tactical nuclear weapons in Europe, uh, they serve more like a symbol of U.S. commitment, if you will, rather than sort of an important military capability. So the military utility of that force is limited, but it's not zero, uh, as we sometimes hear. It certainly has a potential messaging and even potential utility if, if, if it came to that. Um, and the modernization that's now underway of the F-35A and the B-6112 gravity bomb uh, in Europe will certainly enhance that capability. So moreover, the U.S. relies, of course, more on strategic bombers in its signaling. And now with the B-6112 and the transition to the B-21 strategic bomber, we're going to have a new situation in a way where the full range of low, uh, lo low uh, yield or uh, short range capabilities uh, will be added to your strategic bombers, the B-6, uh, the B-21. Um, uh, so that's that's a new situation that will have a broader low yield range than they currently have today. Um, one can make you know, any conclusion out of that that you want, but that's just um, 
a new development I think that's worth uh, keeping an eye on as well. So very different capabilities, very different uh, communication, very different rhetoric, um, which makes it obviously uh, complicated to figure out what is happening when and what could happen next. Uh, so let me stop here and pass on to, to Rose um, for her remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans and Rose, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Hans. That was a very um, sobering presentation, I, I must say. Uh, just one remark, um, actually two remarks. First of all, I uh, this uh, press conference that uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg just gave is, is very fresh news. Um, I'm seeking some clarification. It's my understanding that those remarks were made in answer to a question and that uh, that uh, transcript you showed is not part of his official prepared remarks. So I don't see that as the kind of signaling you, you seem to imply he was, he was answering a question, but I'm seeking clarification on that and I'll get back to the audience when I'm, uh, I'm sure of what the response is. Second, I think those simulations, simple as they are, show uh, the uncertainty that stems from this kind of attack with regard to the fratricidal effects on Russian forces and possibly also on Russian territory, depending on, on the wind direction and other factors associated with meteor, uh, meteorology. Um, I wanted to also bring up what I found very interesting in the last week is that uh, even some, uh, I would say, of the more hardline critics of the Putin regime have, and their, their uh, conduct of the war have brought up uh, some interesting critiques that are related to what I would consider the key point that nuclear war cannot be won and should never be fought. Uh, this uh, blogger named Igor Strelkov, who is, uh, he was the, the leader of the militia that shot down the Malaysian airline flight back in 2014, MH17. He's been regularly blogging on his own telegram channel in Russia. And last week he said, that uh, even though the Ukrainians may have been zombified by their leadership in Kyiv, their Nazi leadership in Kyiv, these are all propaganda lines out of Russia, that they are our own people and therefore it would be a crime to strike them with nuclear weapons. So I do think that there is, uh, despite all the nuclear saber rattling and threatening behavior going on, there is, I would say, a, a true debate, and even some of the harder line individuals in the Russian system uh, seem to be aware of the moral price to be paid uh, for any kind of uh, nuclear use in, in, this, uh, in this terrible war. So those are a few introductory remarks. I wanted to talk about deterrence effects and, and uh, what the Biden administration, as well as uh, NATO have been trying to do in order to deter, I see essentially three levels uh, of attempt to deter in this case. The first is at the political level with firm deterrence messaging coming uh, from the White House in Washington. And I also believe that Jens Stoltenberg at NATO headquarters has been consistent and persistent in laying down a firm uh, declaratory deterrence language uh, today as a continuation of that, as far as I can tell. Again, I'm, I'm seeking further information about the character of the remarks that the Secretary General made today. But uh, the point about the steadfast noon exercise is that it does take place on an annual basis uh, at this time in the autumn and is uh, really designed to ensure that the NATO nuclear deterrent remains uh, safe secure and effective. So we shall see uh, what further comes out about this in coming days, but uh, it is something that is uh, regular and, and uh, takes place on, on an annual basis. The second thing, um, though, this deterrence messaging is, I think, uh, necessary and effective in this political realm, but it's also interesting uh, to me, thinking through this, that this may be one area that there actually will be some uh, effect on Putin and his coterie in the Kremlin. There seems to be, to my mind, a certain back and forth about whether Hiroshima and Nagasaki are a deterrent 
uh, and in the, in the way of being a taboo on the use of nuclear weapons, or whether they actually have those attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II actually set a precedent that uh, the Russians can now uh, refer to if they decide to proceed with the use of nuclear weapons. This may seem like a very fine point, but I've been really noting the back and forth on this question uh, by Putin himself with some other interlocutors. It's very interesting because Soviet and Russian propaganda for the 77 years since Hiroshima and Nagasaki have really placed the blame for the only use of a nuclear weapon in wartime squarely on the shoulders of the United States. And I think that uh, this uh, has been very effective. It's been effective in certain, uh, in certain audiences uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, for example. And it's also true that the Russians have been very clever about keeping the Southern Hemisphere on their side during this crisis over Ukraine, uh, whipping up concerns about the food, uh, the food crisis, for example, and, and talking about this being a, a ne continu con continuation of neo-imperialist behavior by the, the global hegemon, the United States, which seems very, very ironic to me, given that this is imperialist behavior by the Russian Federation. But nevertheless, they have been successful so far at holding the Southern Hemisphere uh, to their side during the crisis, but I believe that a nuclear use by Russia, uh, given these years of Soviet and Russian propaganda about the moral responsibility for Hiroshima and Nagasaki, now shifting to Putin and to the Russian leadership, I think that this could have a profound effect uh, and therefore, uh, it would have a profound effect on, on Southern Hemisphere support for the war and therefore could be serving as a deterrent now on uh, the Russian leader's behavior. Open to debate, but I think it's, uh, it's to my mind, one of the more, more powerful of the political deterrents out there. On the economic side, I don't really believe throwing extra sanctions at, at Putin at this point is going to make a lot of difference. And the glee with which uh, Russian bloggers, hardline bloggers today have applauded the October 10 wide ranging conventional strikes on Ukrainian infrastructure. Uh, and basically they've been saying many of them They've already thrown everything at us they can in economic terms. We're surviving that fine. Let's keep this up. Let's ramp it up. Let's go for more violence, which could, one must be concerned, lead to escalation in the nuclear direction. So that seems to be the mood in Moscow right now. I wanted to refer you all to an excellent piece by Alexander Gobuyev in the Financial Times today, where he talks about the need for preparations for crisis diplomacy against what could be rather rapid escalation on the conventional front, which of course we all hope will not go nuclear. But that economic deterrent, more sanctions, I don't think it's, it's going to make much difference to Russian decision-making and to Vladimir Putin's decision-making at this point. But finally, there are the nuclear deterrents I'm sorry, there are the military deterrents. And here I wanna underscore, despite my slip of tongue, that I do not believe that a nuclear response uh, is something that the United States and its allies should be, should be placing on the table, that we need to stay on the uh, side of perhaps a firm military response, but one that would stay conventional in nature. If it's a kinetic response, the first, tool that could be uh, reached for could be a non-kinetic response, for example, using offensive cyber means. And so I think that should certainly be part of the military options on the table, but also then looking on the conventional side at the potential for strikes uh, against the facilities uh, on Ukrainian territory where such an attack may have uh, originated or potentially also considering an attack on a facility on Russian territory where the attack had, the nuclear attack had, uh, had initiated. But I want to stress two points about this. Any such attack would be, I think, carefully designed to be proportionate and to be responsive to, uh, to this, uh, what would be an egregious attack on, uh, on a Ukrainian target using a nuclear weapon. And second, I want to stress and really underscore that none of these options for uh, military action are desirable to NATO or to the United States of America. These are being thought about and being articulated in a very 
uh, I would say, restrained way in order to convey that there are military options for a response on the table, but by no means are they a desired action at this point by NATO or the United States of America. We, of course, hope to avoid military action and de-escalate this, uh, this conflict in the direction of the negotiating table. And last thing I'll say about that is I agree with Alexander Gabuyev today that we need to be thinking hard about crisis diplomacy at this moment. I too have written in the Financial Times in recent days that we may be uh, wise to think about some nuclear diplomacy in order to bring, as I put it, the temperature down, the nuclear temperature down, and not uh, in any way to endanger the sovereignty and territorial integrity and independence of Ukraine. So we should not be, as we've said quite consistently, negotiated, negotiating about Ukraine over its head, but nevertheless thinking about ways that we might be talking to the Russians at this moment about nuclear restraint and what might be valuable uh, in terms of nuclear restraint at this moment. I applaud the fact that uh, Putin and Xi Jinping very recently, uh, in recent history in February, early before the invasion, talked about uh, moratoria on intermediate range nuclear missiles in Asia and in Europe. That might be one direction to consider consultations and discussions involving both Russia and China, even at a technical level if we can't get the politicians involved and the political leaders involved at this moment, but to begin some technical discussions. And certainly I welcome the fact that as far as New START implementation is concerned, implementation of the New START Treaty, that some technical level consultations have been underway and as I understand will continue. So where I think about diplomacy, it's strictly to bring the temperature down, the escalatory fever and also the nuclear temperature to bring it down. With that, Daryl, over to you. All right, thank you so much for your opening remarks, Rose. And Daryl, before we give the floor to you, just a reminder to all our participants that you can send any questions for the three panelists through the Q&A function in Zoom. And I will sort through those. And after Daryl is done, we will start that Q&A. All right, Daryl, to you. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, thank you, Hans and Rose, for joining us, everyone for joining us. Uh, this is indeed uh, a sobering con uh, conversation. Um, it's sad that not only uh, are we 30 years beyond the so-called end of the Cold War, but we're 60 years beyond uh, the last great crisis, nuclear crisis, the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962. Yet here we are talking about the heightened risk of nuclear war. Um, just to go back to some of the things that Shannon described at the top um, to begin my remarks about what we can do uh, before the fact, before and if Russia employs nuclear weapons for the first time in 77 years. Um, let me just reiterate that uh, Putin's remarks on September 21 in the address announcing the increased mobilization, um, he said, when the territorial integrity of our country is threatened, we will certainly use all means at our disposal to protect Russia and our people. This is not a bluff. So per Putin's words here imply that if he believes there's an attack on Russian territory, or perhaps on the Ukrainian territory that Russia has declared it's annexed, he might order the use of tactical nuclear weapons to, as Hans uh, was uh, outlining, decimate uh, some of Ukraine's defense forces, uh, perhaps its cities uh, to demonstrate Russian resolve uh, or simply to try to intimidate uh, Ukraine and its allies uh, to somehow surrender. Uh, what we have to point out is that that, uh, that threat, if that is a correct interpretation, I'll come to that in a second, veers from Russia's official nuclear doctrine, which reserves the option to use nuclear weapons in response to an attack against Russia with weapons of mass destruction, or if a conventional war threatens the, quote, very existence of the state. And of course, uh, you don't have to be a military expert to understand that what Russia has inflicted on Ukraine does not threaten the existence of the Russian state itself. Um, so uh, we should also note that after Putin made this statement, uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister, Sergei Ribkov attempted, I think, to walk back a little bit Putin's remarks. He said, we are not threatening anyone with nuclear weapons. The criteria for the use are outlined in Russia's military doctrine, he said. So look, I think uh, it, it's difficult to interpret the intentions of the Russian uh, 
leadership. I think they're trying to have it both ways. Um, uh, they're trying to make threats while being able to deny that they're making threats. Um, yeah, but it's, it's clear that even ambiguous threats of nuclear use, especially threats against non-nuclear weapon states like Ukraine, are extremely dangerous and counterproductive and warrant global condemnation. And you know, so first, what, what can we do about this uh, ahead of a potential decision by, by Putin? First, if there are indeed discussions about nuclear use in the Kremlin, Putin's own military, diplomatic, and political advisors have a duty to point out that nuclear threats against Ukraine, its allies and partners, are extremely unwise and ultimately harmful to Russia's position in the world. Uh, Rose uh, you know, mentioned one person who has been uh, bold enough to speak out against the idea of nuclear use in Ukraine. There are others in the Kremlin who need to do this. Um, they need to point out that it, of course, would be illegal, provide no military value for Russia, and create grave threats to Putin, the regime, and maybe Russia itself, and of course, to global security. Now, as we have seen in press reports and statements from U.S. intelligence officials so far, thankfully, there's no sign that Russia is moving its warheads uh, from tactical nuclear warheads from central storage uh, into forward areas. But as uh, CIA Director Bill Burns said back in April, and I think this is wise advice, none of us can take likely the threat posed by potential resort to tactical nuclear weapons uh, by, by Putin. So, you know, in my view, the, the, the risk of Russian nuclear use may, in absolute terms, still be relatively low, but the risk is heightened. And so long it is higher, whether that's you know, it, it, whether there's a 1% chance or a 20% chance or a 30% chance, uh, it doesn't matter. We need to do everything we can uh, to push back against these nuclear threats and to reduce uh, the risk. So what can we do um, ahead of this uh, to reduce the risks? I mean, first and foremost, I think it's imperative that responsible leaders, not just in Washington, but around the world, reinforce the nuclear weapons taboo by making statements, making condemnate, statements of condemnation that delegitimize nuclear threats and warn of the consequences to everyone of nuclear use. Uh, and I think they need to do so um, if they're from NATO or the United States without making uh, unhelpful escalatory counter threats. So let me just note what I'm talking about. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Joe Biden was speaking on 60 Minutes. He was asked what he would say to Putin if if Putin were considering using chemical or tactical nuclear weapons, Biden replied, don't, don't, don't. You will change the face of war anything, uh, unlike anything since World War II. Uh, that's a smart response. Uh, it's helpful. Um, since then, some US officials have further elaborated publicly and in private that there would be, quote, catastrophic consequences if Moscow used nuclear weapons in Ukraine. It's good that US officials have been in direct contact with their counterparts in Russia. I personally think the invocation of the word catastrophic was probably uh, inadvisable since that implies a potential US nuclear response, um, which would compound the damage and the risks by inviting further escalation. Um, and again, uh, many of us in the last few days have been asked about Biden's latest uh, comments, his Armageddon comments at the fundraiser on October 6th, uh, in which he said, I don't think there's any such thing as the ability to easily use a tactical nuclear weapon and not end up with Armageddon. Well, that's startling language for a president or for any senior U.S. official to utter, but I think Biden is entirely right in trying to shake us out of our complacency. It's his duty as the president to explain what's at stake and to speak out forcefully against nuclear war and one of the risks and the costs of escalation to the nuclear level. Hans was uh, outlining what modern tactical nuclear weapons can do. I just want to be a little bit, I uh, want to underscore this. I mean, these are devastating and indiscriminate killing machines. Uh, according to Hans's estimates, uh, Russia has about 450 air and ground-based short-range warheads. They've got more that could be deployed on, on sea-based systems. Um, many of these have yield equivalents approaching the Hiroshima bomb. Uh, 
And we've got to remember that the Hiroshima bomb on August 6, 1945 killed 140,000 people um, between August 6th and the end uh, of 1945 and the end of 1945. So um, as the president said, uh, this would change the face of the war in Ukraine and warfare um, in ways we have not seen uh, since World War II. But if Putin does become more desperate uh, and somehow against all logic does order the use of nuclear weapons, um, the response options, uh, which Rose began to outline, um, they range from terrible <clears throat> to catastrophic. Um, and so for that reason, you know, I think we need to be not so much thinking about how would NATO or the United States respond, but how can we prevent this moment from happening? Because if Putin were to order the use of nuclear weapons, deterrence will have failed. And quite frankly, uh, the risk of escalation goes up exponentially. How much? We don't know. But notions of a, that a nuclear war can be limited and controlled are fantasy. That's what President Biden was talking about when he made his comments on October 6th. So my, my main point here is that to prevent this kind of catastrophe and to push back against Putin's efforts to use nuclear coercion, other global leaders need to join Biden's denunciations of Putin's flirtations with nuclear weapons use. And they should do so now. Uh, I would just note that at the United Nations, as we speak, there's a debate going on on a resolution condemning Russia's illegal annexation of four Ukrainian provinces. That would be a good starting point for Russia, I'm sorry, for China, India, uh, many of the African states that have stood uh, kind of on the sidelines of this debate about uh, Russia's war in Ukraine to speak up and to speak clearly against threats of use of nuclear weapons as violations of international law, including the UN Charter. And I would just note that uh, back in June, the state's parties to the 2017 Treaty on the, the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons um, uh, led the way, and they showed the way through a declaration they issued uh, that cited recent nuclear threats and demanded that all nuclear armed states never use or threaten to use nuclear weapons under any circumstances. That's the kind of clear, unequivocal condemnation we need from more leaders, not just from Washington. Um, the other thing I would just note is that there are ways to square the views of the P3, the United States, uh, France, and Britain, uh, and non-nuclear weapon states on the issue of condemning nuclear threats, uh, perhaps even at this UN uh, General Assembly uh, debate this week. Uh, they could uh, add to that resolution, in theory, a demand to halt any and all nuclear weapons threats against a uh, non-nuclear weapon state in good standing with its nuclear non-proliferation obligations. That's Ukraine. Uh, such wording, I think, could win the support of nuclear armed and non-nuclear weapon states um, who uh, are looking at this situation. And in particular, Putin's enablers, uh, China's Xi Jinping and India's Narendra Modi uh, and other leaders have a responsibility, not just publicly, but privately to remind Putin that the risks of nuclear weapons use outweigh any perceived gains. And I would just note that India and China have national policies of no first use, uh, which should further uh, compel them and encourage them to reiterate um, the uh, irrationality and uh, of Putin threatening the use of nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear weapon state uh, or anywhere. So, um, those are some of the things that I think we need to be thinking about now. Um, my main point here is that how we dissuade uh, Putin from taking this uh, potential step uh, doesn't just depend on Joe Biden uh, or NATO, but it depends on the, the world's reactions. And now is the time to act. And we have to remind Putin, though he may be cold, calculating, and cruel, that even according to his own logic, nuclear weapons use runs counter to his interests. And just like in 1962, um, the use of nuclear weapons doesn't make sense. Uh, it doesn't make sense in 2022. So thanks, and I look forward to everybody's comments or questions. We'll do our best to address as many of them as we can. Back to you, Shannon.
Great, thank you, Daryl and Rose and Hans for your opening remarks. So as Daryl said, we have had a great number of questions rolling in from all of you. I am going to start off with one that we have received from Voice of America. It's been a topic that has come to the forefront, especially since Biden's remarks last week. And Daryl had already um, kind of started to answer this, but I wanted to ask it more directly given the question rolling in. So I'll go around to all three of you first, Rose, Hans, and then Daryl. And the question is that many experts now compare the current Russian nuclear blackmail to the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Could you compare these two situations, specifically the level of danger between them, as well as the differences between them? So Rose, you're on the hot seat first. Over to you. I, I'm sure both Hans and Daryl will have some comments. Uh, the key difference between the two crises is that the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, was uh, with regard to the central strategic systems. So both the United States and the Russian Federation were directly facing off against each other with uh, Khrushchev and the, and the Rus Soviet government at that time uh, deploying uh, intermediate range missiles in Cuba that would easily reach key targets in the United States on a very short uh, warning time. Uh, and uh, that was really uh, seen as uh, the, the core a uh, step that could trigger a nuclear exchange between the United States and the USSR. We are not talking about that in uh, most of these scenarios, although we are well concerned about, uh, about the potential for escalation to central strategic systems, but the focus so far has been very much on uh, the use of perhaps a single uh, warhead uh, of a non-strategic nature on a facility in Ukraine, a military facility to send a stark message and to terrify the Ukrainians and their partners and allies into capitulating or the use of a also a nuclear demonstration strike, as it's been called, perhaps over the Black Sea, with the same purpose of driving Ukraine and its allies and partners to the negotiating table. So it's more a weapon of terror. And this is more, as, as these scenarios are laid out, they are more uh, to, to terrorize and uh, impel capitulation rather than the notion of a central strategic exchange. So I think that that is the key difference uh, so far. One other key difference that actually concerns me quite a bit and uh, has, I think, begun to excite some commentary elsewhere, and that is very much John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev and their immediate leadership teams were involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis. There was a line of communication, however tenuous it was. There wasn't much in those days, the hotline, came out of the Cuban Missile Crisis because it was not easy for, for the White House and the Kremlin to communicate, but they were communicating through various interlocutors. I saw someone uh, uh, posted a, a note concerning Graham Allison's uh, recent piece, uh, Forearms Control Today, but also, of course, his classic book, The Essence of Decision, talks about the lines of communication and how they operated during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Today, the two presidents are not talking to each other. Uh, for whatever um, reason, that diplomacy is something that Washington is is uh, is not taking on. President Biden has made clear his views that uh, Vladimir Putin is a war criminal, and uh, Vladimir Putin has responded that uh, these remarks are unforgivable. So the communications between the the two top leaders have been very much on ice, and uh, I think for good reason in many ways. But uh, I do uh, think that. Uh, communicating at a high level at some point during this crisis will, will be necessary. Hans, over to you. Thanks, Rose. Um, all good uh, comments, of course. Um, and I totally agree that there are significant differences between the two situations, um, both as they happened in terms of the amount of forces and the character of forces that were directly involved. Um, that, was, that was nuclear signaling on the highest level. Um, we don't have that direct nuclear uh, counter deterrence uh, explicitly in this uh, scenario. Um, to, in my view, required a couple of steps before we get there. Yes, there is communication about capabilities, but, but it's not nearly at that level. The other thing I think is really different and very important is that today uh, the West has uh, in, enormously capable conventional uh, long range forces that actually gives it options to respond to these type of low tier scenarios 
that does not require nuclear weapons. That's a completely different situation compared to the 1960s. All right, thank you, Hans. Daryl, to you. Oh, uh, well, real quick. I mean, this, this is a good analysis here. Um, I would just point out a few things. I mean, you know, as Mark Twain said uh, once, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. So it's many of us are hearkening back to the Cuban Missile Crisis because I think as Biden said, and I think he said accurately, we have not been at a sustained uh, level of heightened nuclear risk uh, to the degree we are today since 1962. There have been other near misses um, between 1962 and 2022, certainly. Um, but uh, one of the things that's disconcerting about the situation is that while the Cuban Missile Crisis, I think, was clearly a more acute and serious risk of all-out nuclear war than we have right now, uh, you know, that was a relatively short crisis, you know, 13 plus days. This is a crisis that is ongoing, uh, you know, 13 months. I mean, it's hard to tell how long this is going to last. And so long as this war goes on, and so long as Putin is making these veiled threats, not just against Ukraine, but against the US and, and NATO, if they were to intervene, we are going to be at a heightened state of, of nuclear risk. One similarity I would note is that in the Cuban Missile Crisis, nuclear weapons use would have, um, we would have seen nuclear weapons use if US ground forces, naval forces became directly engaged with Russian ground or naval forces. We still have that kind of risk today, although the hair trigger may not be quite as, as low. Um, you know, I think that remains the greatest risk of um, escalation and nuclear war uh, surrounding the Ukraine crisis. And that's why I think Biden and uh, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg have been restrained in their um, their comments and their actions in response to you know what Putin has said about nuclear weapons and uh, that that relative restraint and good judgment about not um, getting getting engaged with Russian forces directly by design or accident is going to be important as we go forward. Great, thank you, Daryl. And then Hans, you said that you have a quick comment. Um, so Great. you have a, give your comment and then I have a slew of questions that I'm going to throw your way next. Okay, I, I just think it's, it, 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 to me at least, it's sort of comparing apples and oranges, um, this today and, and, you, and Cuban Missile Crisis, their parallels and their differences and all that stuff. I think the key issue here is um, whatever is happening in Ukraine is completely uh, new and unprecedented in the post-Cold War, this is the phase we live in. This is where it's so dramatically different. And that is what we have to return. We have to turn that direction around. All right, thank you, Hans. So prepare yourself. I'm gonna to group together a few questions for you, Hans, that have rolled in. So first of all, um, you had said that there would be considerable steps necessary before Russia could use a tactical nuclear weapon. So the question here is getting at how do the US and its allies and partners detect any signs of potential imminent Russian nuclear use, specifically when it comes to tactical nuclear weapons. And then um, there's a second part to this question. Ah, yes. Can you give any sense of how long it would take for Russia to bring out transport and ready tactical nuclear weapons before use? And lastly, there's a third part, sorry. If US intelligence did detect a movement of Russian nuclear weapons, would and should they publicize that information or should they attempt to deter use privately? All right, lots of questions your way, Hans, the floor is yours. Okay, so I'm neither in the US government or in the Russian government. So of course I don't have access to the, to the details of that. My, my speculation is that for Russia to activate, um, and this is related to the second one about how long, yes, strategic forces are on alert. You know, in theory, they can fly on very, very short notice, but um, it's unlikely um, uh, that strategic central forces are going to be used in such a scenario. Um, like I said, tactical nuclear weapons will take uh, longer. How long? We don't know, but probably several days to activate the units and bring them out. Um, but again, there are all these changes that have to happen from the, from the decision at the leadership 
the trickling down of those orders into the military ranks, the activities at the level of the bunkers, the transport out to the units, the mating of the warheads with the unit, and then a launch order. Uh, so there's so many links in that chain that potentially are you know, vulnerable to detection. Um, but of course, if Putin wanted the West and Ukraine to sweat, he may not want necessarily to do it as quickly as he can. Uh, he, he could delay this over a week, you know, or give examples of how he's beginning to prepare for this type of stuff. You know, that's that's coercion, obviously. Um, finally, should the West publish this? Um, it, well, it has been publishing its uh, conclusion that they haven't seen anything uh, repeatedly. Just yesterday, did it again. Um, so you and it has been publishing detailed information about Russia's conventional operations and, and its preparation. So you can imagine that the West would decide to say that we have detected this and use that to turn up the diplomatic, the international pressure on Russia. So it is conceivable whether it's smart it depends entirely on the situation. Thank you, Hans. And then lastly, just an FYI to people who had messaged asking for Hans slides. He generously said that he will make them available. So we'll get those to all of you after the event concludes today. So Rose, I have next up a batch of questions for you to take on. And I also wanted to see if you had any comments on the questions that were posed to Hans, given your seat at the State Department and within NATO. So if there's anything you wanted to add there. But then the other questions rolling in for you is that you have started to detail some of the options for the United States and international actors to deter Russia from nuclear use. So the questions we're asking for more specificity on what the US or the world can offer Russia to encourage nuclear restraint, especially since it sounds like sanctions will not work so much. And then second, another question about if Putin did order a nuclear strike, do you think there would be any resistance to his orders within Russia? All right, over to you, Rose. Questions, thank you very, very much, whoever asked them. Uh, I did want to note, and uh, Daryl actually also provided me the information, but I did get word from NATO directly that the Secretary General did make some remarks, some prepared remarks uh, about uh, Steadfast Noon, uh, but also then he answered a question about Steadfast Noon. So there is a transcript out now of this press conference in advance of the Defense Ministerial in, in NATO headquarters tomorrow, so uh, you can all read that if, if you are interested in getting the exact wording. Uh, the diplomatic options. Here I am thinking about a way to, um, to engage, uh, how shall I put it at this point, it's hard to talk about uh, the Russian leadership and angels, but to engage with the better angels of their nature, because traditionally uh, the Russian leadership has been very supportive of strategic arms control and non-proliferation. They have really been giants of the non-proliferation regime. And my interest in uh, bringing forward the INF moratorium proposal was the fact that Putin himself proposed what I call a refreshed version of it in October of 2020. The original proposal made to NATO, I was at NATO as Deputy Secretary General, I received the original proposal, it was nonsense. It was a one-sided moratorium. The US would keep its stuff out of Europe and Russia would be allowed to continue to deploy the 9M729, the missile that violates the INF treaty. So that was a non-starter, but the offer in 2020 in October was to remove the 9M729 from Europe and have verification measures uh, to confirm that removal. So we, we've never gotten down to exploring this at the negotiating table. And now with Xi joining in and saying that a INF moratorium should be extended to Asia, perhaps this is a time where we could actually get the three largest nuclear weapon states to sit down and begin to engage together. Whether it would have a direct bearing on uh, the crisis in Ukraine is tenuous, of course, I grant that, but it is in large measure a political argument about the necessity of engaging 
the three capitals on what for the United States and Russia has now been 50 years of experience working together to control and limit nuclear weapons. And that the effect of the engagement, even at a technical level, could begin to have, uh, have an impact on, uh, on the mood on the inside, on uh, the thinking on the inside. So, uh, and certainly, as, as I said, we already have discussions going on at a technical level about resuming uh, the um, the new start uh, inspection regime at, that was halted during the COVID pandemic. I think this is very good, and I think uh, that it will continue. I, I hope to see it bear fruit uh, before too long. So uh, this is the kind of activity I, I have been thinking about. By the way, I noted somebody asked, could this be done uh, solely at a technical level? Can technical experts so-called self-start and dive into negotiations? No, of course not. They need to have the political go-ahead, the uh, po political uh, instruction to do so. But nevertheless, then they can be, the talks can be carried out very much on a technical level, I believe. Uh, well, I have long wondered about whether there could be differences of view uh, among the Russian uh, military. Uh, I noted Strelkov's remarks. Uh, you know, he's pretty well plugged in uh, certain um, in certain uh, realms of the more far, uh, I would say, far nationalist groups in military groups in in Russia. So that's good that he's raised uh, the uh, the moral issue. Uh, I wouldn't expect it from him. But whether they would refuse to obey an outright order, of course, it's impossible for me uh, to speculate. But uh, I will say that I think there is room for discussion and debate and for uh, simply uh, proceeding uh, according to uh, what would be the normal and routine protocols as we saw historically with uh, the Colonel Petrov response to Abel Archer. And I note once again that there's been some uh, work recently on this and some uh, interesting um, interesting further historical work. So, but I, I don't wanna speculate somehow that there would be uh, diso uh, uh, disobedience to a direct order from Putin, but there could perhaps be, and I believe there is room for debate and discussion within the Russian system, including with the strategic rocket forces and the, the 12th main directorate of the general staff responsible for, uh, for nuclear weapons. By the way, I heard this morning that they too are holding, the SRF is holding a uh, conference on the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. I wish I could be a fly on the wall for those discussions. Great, thank you so much, Rose, for tackling all we threw your way. So next, we have a few questions for you, Daryl, that I'm going to package together, and I may come back around to Rose and Hans, the two of you just let me know if you would like to chime in as well. So Daryl, we are having a few questions specifically on how the United States and allies and partners can um, pull in at the countries like China, excuse me, to try and deter the possibility of Russian nuclear use. So we've seen at the end of September, a political report surface saying that there are growing calls for the United States and its allies to pressure specifically China as well as India to communicate to Putin that the use of nuclear weapons will prompt an economic and diplomatic response from the international community, including China and India. The two countries have called, for example, for a peaceful resolution of the war this week after devastating strikes in Ukraine following the attack on Kerch Bridge. So do you support these calls for China and India to attempt to influence Putin? And what other like efforts could be undertaken by the Biden administration to downgrade the threat of nuclear use alongside allies and partners? Over to you. All right, good questions, uh, difficult questions. Um, well, I think, I mean, as the, the questions suggest, uh, in recent weeks, uh, Chinese and Indian leaders have started expressing some consternation about uh, the course of Putin's war in Ukraine. Uh, in recent hours, we've heard calls uh, from those two capitals for de-escalation and, of course, uh, Putin's ordering of over 100 missile attacks on 10 Ukrainian cities is not exactly de-escalation. Um, so I think the, the trick is, is to try to encourage uh, the leaders in those two capitals and other capitals, particularly in developing states in Africa who have 
been reluctant to strongly criticize Moscow's actions, uh, to more clearly and specifically uh, uh, argue against uh, Russia issuing even veiled nuclear threats, particularly against a non-nuclear weapon state. Uh, and I think it's important, you know, I'm, I'm uh, Hans just said he's not in the Russian or the U.S. government. I'm not an American diplomat. Rose uh, once served as a diplomat, so maybe she's got some thoughts about this. But I think the operative word for U.S. diplomats uh, and, and, and Western diplomats is to try to persuade, not pressure, uh, Beijing and New Delhi and other capitals to um, try to reach out to Putin and to Foreign Minister Lavrov. Um, I mean, this is a this is a an exercise in persuasion. It's not pressure. I don't think uh, the Chinese or the Indians are going to take kindly to being told you know how to behave. But I think this is a conversation that has to happen, uh, probably between foreign ministers, and it has to take place now. Um, and there needs to be some, I think, uh, efforts, common effort by uh, the international community to publicly uh, condemn uh, any and all types of nuclear threats, uh, and certainly the use of nuclear weapons, especially against non-nuclear weapon states. Um, so that's what I would, that's what I would suggest and answer that good question. Um, one other just quick thing I wanted to mention in response to the question that Hans got about what could be done if US intelligence detected that Russia was moving warheads from storage to forward deployment. I would just point out that we may not know, we may know, we may not know. Uh, but in the situation, intelligence is not necessarily 100% uh, accurate. Uh, one of the lessons of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and of course, that was 60 years ago, is that we didn't know. Uh, that the Russians had actually deployed uh, nuclear weapons in Cuba, and they would have been used if uh, Kennedy had ordered an invasion of Cuba. So um, that is one of the, the dangers and the uncertainties of the present situation. U.S. intelligence has been very good with respect to Russia's war in Ukraine, but uh, we can't necessarily count on it to give us that early warning. Thank you, Daryl. So speaking on the topic of allies, Rose, I just want to jump back to you real quick. There are a few questions coming in asking about what European allies can do to contribute in a way to, to excuse me, to contribute in a concrete way to nuclear restraint and to help lower the risk of nuclear escalation. Over to you. Thank you, Shannon, very much. I have to emphasize that um, for the European allies at this time, their focus, uh, I think, both is remaining squarely on continuing to provide every assistance to Ukraine uh, on the military, economic, and political front. And I put I put it in that order on purpose because I think the military assistance is most important at this point. And I really emphasize that what the Ukrainians need now is help to defend their airspace. And so whatever NATO can do, NATO can, countries can do to help to provide uh, further missile defense, uh, further uh, air defense capabilities to Ukraine, I think that has got to be the absolute top priority at, at this moment. Furthermore, and I've just started thinking about this uh, today, I, I'd be interested in what Daryl and Hans think about this, but interdiction. Um, we've got uh, Russia buying drones from Iran for example, um, is there anything that we should be thinking about in terms of, uh, of trying to inter interdict those shipments? Now, Russia would not take kindly to that and might very well take that as an escalatory action. Uh, but uh, the Pro proliferation security initiative uh, and um, various proliferation control regimes have had uh, certain things to say about use of, of weapons against civilian targets, for example. I haven't thought this through, so I'm speaking very much off the top of my head, but I'd be interested what uh, what others on this call would say about uh, about trying to take some action to, uh, to prevent some of these shipments from uh, arriving at their destination. But certainly what NATO can do is uh, a lot, I think, to help to bolster air and missile defenses in, in Ukraine at this time. Thank you. So Hans, Daryl, did either of you want to jump in on this question as well and the ideas that Rose had mentioned? 
Yeah, it's a, I, I haven't thought through it. Um, two thoughts that come to mind, of course, is um, we spent a lot of time during the war on terror to develop um, uh, techniques and capabilities to interdict um, at various levels. And so there may be something there. Um, the other one to think about, of course, is that is whether once you start interdicting shipments, um, whether it opens up uh, Russian interdiction of NATO shipments. Um, there's, a, there's sort of a back and forth there as well. So I don't know with for or against, I'm just raising these, these particular issues. Well, I would just say about the interdiction option, I have not thought this through all that much, but I mean, it would have to weigh the costs and the benefits. And I think it would be very difficult to effectively interdict all the potential transit lines. Uh, and there might be a high risk uh, if there were a in incident involving, you know, an Iranian flagged vessel, a Russian flagged vessel that just may not be worth the value of interdicting that particular shipment. I mean, I, I would agree with Rose that the immediate issue, and this is already in process, is to bolster Ukraine's um, short range air defense uh, against these missile attacks, which I, I doubt Russia can sustain over time, but uh, that would be the priority. Um, I mean, on the larger question that Rose got uh, before, I mean, what can the United States and NATO do to lower the temperature? You know, I would, I would suggest that, uh, you know, the United States and NATO should reconsider whether steadfast noon should go ahead on schedule. Uh, the reason is this, is that um, uh, we have a, a number of um, potential problems already uh, over Ukrainian airspace, um, sea lanes in the Black Sea, where U Russian and NATO aircraft and naval vessels uh, could uh, get a little too close. Um, steadfast noon could be misinterpreted, um, and it might also be a useful signal um, from the West that it has no intentions to threaten nuclear weapons or use nuclear weapons by simply uh, postponing the exercise. Uh, the Biden administration did um, postpone some Minuteman three, right, you know, scheduled uh, test launches um, at the beginning of uh, this, this uh, crisis earlier this year. Um, and I would just note that, um, you know, there, there are there's a range of nuclear threats. Um, the steadfast noon exercise is not a threat, but it is a reminder that NATO has nuclear capabilities that could be used against two, well, of course, Russia. So it, it's another form of reminding uh, one's opponent that we have nuclear capabilities too, and um, it could easily be interpreted by the Russians as uh, uh, an escalation, or they could use it as an excuse to accuse the West of escalation. So I think um, NATO would be smart to think that through before they, they go ahead with that exercise. Can I just jump in really quickly, uh, Shannon? I, I, um, I withdraw my remarks about interdiction. I see the downsides clearly from both what, what both uh, Hans and Daryl had to say. But I do wonder if there's something uh, in the body of uh, regimes that we have out there that we should perhaps be considering, at least in order to hold the Russians to account for their, their use of these, these missiles against civilian targets. It could help to bolster the already wide-ranging case that's being made against, uh, against their inhumane uh, use of weapons against, uh, against uh, critical infrastructure and other civilian targets. So, but I withdraw what I had to say earlier. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. Hans, you also had a quick comment. Yeah, I think it, you know, picking up what what Daryl said about steadfast noon. Um, it is true that it is not uh, an exercise that has been set up uh, right now because of what's happening. Uh, there, is, there is one particular element why, particularly now, it might be smart to think about how to. Um, how to use or not use that exercise. Uh, the point being here that we're in the middle of a and consideration between Russia and Belarus about the potential deployment. There's been a number of statements about whether Belarus would be involved in some kind of nuclear sharing. Um, 
we have seen the Polish uh, president uh, suggesting he would like to get involved in nuclear sharing. Um, so there's a number of, of issues relating to nuclear sharing that are happening right now in Europe. And it might be smart to think about um, whether or to what extent the way we talk and the way we act about um, nuclear sharing and, and, and tactical uh, exercises uh, need, needs to be sort of revised or, or fine-tuned to, to where we are. Yeah, I, I, can, I can appreciate that, but let me just emphasize a couple of further points here. Sorry to jump in once again, and I'm sorry I'm going to have to leave you in a, a few moments for another meeting, but uh, but first of all, I, uh, I would re-emphasize that during the uh, Madrid summit, when the new strategic concept was launched, there was a huge debate inside NATO about whether to tear up the NATO-Russia founding act and dispense with such critical NATO policy as the three no's. One of which is that uh, you, NATO, following its expansion uh, to the Warsaw Pact countries, including uh, Poland, would not deploy nuclear weapons uh, on those territories. And I uh, want to underscore for this audience that after a big debate, it was agreed at the Madrid summit by the NATO member states. It's part of the NATO concept, strategic concept going forward that uh, essentially those three no's remain intact. Uh, and for the moment, uh, there is absolutely no uh, view as to, to changing them. So I think that's an important point to, to make clear, despite obviously some political players uh, making making the case that, that this should happen. But uh, NATO is a consensus decision-making body and that critical NATO-Russia founding act remains uh, in place at this time. And uh, the other point in that regard is that consensus decision-making governs all critical decisions that NATO uh, makes. And so I think at this point, stressing the continued routine nature of this exercise is, is the most important thing and thinking about ways to continue to stay in close communication uh, both across the alliance and with the Russians about its nature is uh, is going to be the most important thing. Great, thank you, Rose. And I know you have to jump off in about a minute or so. So I want to, if we can steal you for one more second, there's a last question that I wanna put your way, which is you had mentioned a little bit about the US-Russian bilateral strategic stability dialogue. Um, in your remarks. So a, an, a participant had asked about the status of that dialogue, if it is completely and permanently suspended, and pairing that with a question about what venue or what vehicle do you think will be used to potentially resume bilateral talks between the United States and Russia on a follow-on agreement to new start? Well, I can tell you my opinion on this. This is my personal opinion. I'm obviously not working for the government anymore. so. Um, take it with a grain of salt, but I believe that uh, we need to focus as a primary objective on uh, putting in place a framework for the replacement of the new START treaty. I would not get into a wide ranging discussion of strategic stability issues again. I would basically not waste my time on that. It's gonna take time for us to get back to the table. This crisis will have to have dissipated somewhat we'll have to be on our on the road to some kind of a resolution i think before we will be able to get back to talking uh, to the russians about these critical topics so i would really focus on establishing uh, the framework for a new start follow-on by the way i think that this is something that could perhaps at least be begun at a technical level uh, perhaps in the context of, of continuing to work through the implementation issues on on new start uh, but Honestly, I would place the emphasis on a very pragmatic next step, the replacement for the New START Treaty, which will go out of force in February of 2026. And I would not throw the agenda open to a wide ranging discussion that could result in years of no doubt interesting substantive discussion, but not produce the result that we need, which is a follow on to the New START Treaty. Thank you, Rose, and thank you for joining us today. I know you have to hop off, but it was yeah. great to have you with us. Thank Very you Very sorry, and apologies to my two eminent uh, colleagues who uh, have been on the panel as well. Thank you, Shannon. No worries, take care. So Hans and Daryl, we have about 13 minutes left with some questions, so there are a few more I wanna hit on. But I know, Daryl, you will certainly have thoughts on the question that I asked Rose about the strategic stability dialogue and future potential U.S.-Russian arms control negotiations. So did you want to weigh in with thoughts and opinions? Well, just real real quick, I think Rose had it just right that um, 
it's important to for for the United States and Russia at a high level to resume uh, or begin negotiations on a new nuclear arms control framework. Um, uh, I would just note that President Biden himself said on August 1, uh, before the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference started, uh, my administration is ready to uh, negotiate, begin negotiations, but we must have a, uh, a partner, a good faith partner. So uh, Russia has stated the same thing. Um, they need to get to the table. I think it can happen maybe sooner than later, and I think it could be a good way to not just um, communicate in this difficult time, but to do what we need to do, which is to maintain limits on the two world's largest nuclear arsenals. Um, but what, we've got lots of other questions. Maybe we can, Hans, you and I can do a rapid fire attempt at answering some of these. All right, so my intention now is to turn to a few questions that we got regarding escalation and to more clearly spell that out. So. Two questions on that that I want to pull out are that in thinking about escalation scenarios between Ukraine and Russia, would a kinetic attack by Ukraine against one or more military or critical infrastructure targets in the Russian homeland likely trigger a tactical nuclear response, even if it does not pose a threat to the very existence of the state? And then the second question is, would Russia be willing to cross that nuclear threshold just to drop a new tactical weapon? If they're dropping a package of nuclear weapons out of desperation, why would they stop there? Would an escalation be inevitable? So let's go to Hans first, and then you, Daryl. Uh, on, the U on the Ukrainian strike into Russia, well, they've already conducted several strikes into Russia. Um, so that, that line has already been crossed. I mean, obviously, you can talk about could they do more and more significant strategic targets, so to speak. But, uh, but, but they have done several things. They've also struck into uh, Crimea, of course, that Russia very much considers his own and all that kind of stuff. So, so I think that line has already been crossed, but it is, a, it is a factor in the type of weapons that the United States is willing to hand over to, to Ukraine, of course. Um, the, the other one was about would they stop at one, <laughs> as the way I understood it. Um, and, uh, and there's no there's no certainty, there's no linear logic here. You, you can't predict this stuff. Um, once these things start to be used, uh, all sorts of other uh, scenarios open up. Um, I don't think, you know, I don't think the Russians will s just start, you know, throwing nukes around uh, because of their concern about how it can escalate. Um, but we can't rule it out and we have to um, pay you know, attention to this and make sure that, uh, that we debate and discuss these things. There is a nasty flip side of this debate, of course, which is that uh, from Putin's point of view, when we have debates like these in the West and when Western leaders say, oh, nuclear weapons would be terrible and, 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 and that stuff, he, he in a way probably is pleased about that. He has our attention. Um, he wants us to be afraid of what he might do with nuclear weapons, whether he will do it or not. So, so there is that that sort of flip side to the discussion as well. Thank you, Hans. Daryl? Yeah, well, just on this question, I mean, this kind of goes back to some of the things we were saying at the beginning. I mean, I think we need to understand that even from Russia's perspective, I mean, using nuclear weapons, um, let's say, I think as the question was, in, in response to Ukrainian attacks inside Russian territory, uh, it, it's, it would not just be disproportionate, it wouldn't make any sense from a Russian military standpoint. Um, that's not how you retaliate to like the Kerch bridge attack uh, or a Ukrainian Neptune missile strike against Russian airfields um, in Russian territory. Um, why? Because of the enormous destructive effects of nuclear weapons. These are not just larger uh, detonations. Um, these are massively larger detonations, plus radiation, plus fire and heat effects. Um, and more than anything, Putin has got to understand that if he uses nuclear weapons in any way uh, in the, the conflict uh, first, um, it's, it, it, it risks bringing in the exact thing that he's wanted to avoid from the very beginning, NATO and US direct military involvement in the conflict. That was the purpose of his original uh, 
nuclear threats on February 24th and on April 27th. It was against any country that might interfere. Uh, second, he's got to, he would have to be thinking about how his uh, so-called allies, uh, China and India, would respond, how the international community would respond, uh, and how his inner circle would respond. And as well, the Russian people who are already very upset about the, the so-called partial mobilization of 300,000 Russian conscripts. So, I mean, for all these reasons, this is why, you know, I would argue that it doesn't make sense, even according to Putin's cool uh, logic, cold logic. Um, and uh, so you know, the scenario in which I see this possibly happening is if Russia's losses mount, if Putin becomes, uh, is put in a politically tenuous position inside the Kremlin, and he needs to do this to try in a desperate attempt to flip the script. That's why we've begun talking about this possibility uh, now, especially since uh, the Ukrainian forces on the ground have begun to make gains and, and Russia is obviously uh, on its back foot and Putin's on his back foot. All right, we'll have, thank you, Daryl and Hans. We'll have two more rounds of questions before we close out. So next round, I want to focus on questions that we've gotten about communications between the United States and Russia in a situation, in a crisis situation where there's the risk of escalation. So someone had asked whether, quote, the red phone in some form still exists. Um, so Daryl and Hans, if you could weigh in on what types of communications there are between US and Russian leaders at a high level, as well as between um, military officials, perhaps, and then as well as between foreign ministry officials as well, in order to try and downgrade a situation in which there might be a risk of nuclear escalation. Hans, do you want to go first? And then Daryl? Sure. I, I, I can't say that I have a good picture of what channels that exist, but, um, but it's my impression, of course, that there are channels, you know, there are phones you, you, you call in and, and, and have a conversation between mil military to military, high ranking officials, what have you. Um, uh, we've seen that on a number of occasions, uh, a number of occasions, both both here, but also in the relations with China, of course. Um, so there are those uh, channels, um, and uh, they will be immensely important um, if and when, well, even now, but but certainly specifically if uh, there is a further escalation of this conflict, because you know that's when you would want to do everything you can to de-escalate that. Uh, development um, and direct the, the direct communication is just essential to to, to that whole process. Um, but again, I don't know the details lines that are open. I mean, you know, you'd have to ask somebody who is currently in the government. Daryl. Well, just real quick. I mean, the, the modern day equivalent of the the hotline, uh, which was established in 1963. Um, exists uh, from the White House to the Kremlin. There are lines of communication between the foreign ministers uh, uh, from the, the Pentagon to the Russian Ministry of Defense. There are also nuclear risk reduction centers uh, here in Washington and Moscow where uh, there are lower level uh, communications in, uh, between uh, the two governments about uh, activities and incidents that, that um, uh, could be of concern. Um, so the question is, you know, are these being used regularly and what is being said? Um, what none of us can know exactly is, you know, what the White House, what the president, the national security advisor said to their counterparts in recent days since Putin's September 21 threats. And finally, you know, the other thing, the other lesson from the Cuban Missile Crisis is often you need a back channel. So uh, I don't know, have no idea if something like that uh, is underway. And finally, um, you know, what is the off ramp? What is the solution uh, to get out of an escalatory cycle? And that is the, that is the tough problem here. Um, there is no clear uh, exit ramp for Vladimir Putin that does not involve um, uh, losing um, militarily, politically, or personally. Great, thank you, Daryl and Hans. So we will last, we will end on a few last questions that we received about doctrine. So in this situation, and if the, if the United States should not even consider a nuclear response to a Russian use of nuclear weapons against Ukraine, 
why should the US not change its nuclear doctrine to a no first use or sole purpose policy? So Hans to you and then Daryl. Well, in this case, um, strictly speaking, we're not talking about a nuclear threat against NATO or a nuclear threat against the United States in the first phase here. Of course, things can escalate. But the scenario we're talking about is a scenario in which you, uh, Russia uses nuclear weapons in Ukraine, not against NATO, not against the United States. Um, and US nuclear policy, nuclear doctrine doesn't really apply in that situation, if you will. It's normally a scenario where, where NATO is under attack or the United States is under attack. How do you apply it then? Um, so it would be a little sort of on the fly here in terms of you know figuring out um, what is the most appropriate thing? Um, I, I also find it hard to imagine that an organization like NATO with 30 member countries would be able to decide um, in, you know, in unity that sure, let's respond nuclear to, to Putin's nuclear weapons use. I, I don't think that's gonna, that's gonna happen. Uh, there are several steps that, that will happen before that. So I think it's much more credible, much more interesting to talk about what would non-nuclear uh, options be and of course, with focus on trying to de-escalate the, the, the situation. Um, sh so sh but should the United States pursue uh, other nuclear policies? Uh, I think, yes, it could pursue a, a sole purpose policy. Um, personally, I find it hard to imagine real military scenarios which, in which it is necessary for the United States to strike first with, uh, with nuclear weapons. Um, uh, I know there's a big and old debate about that, and we can have that debate another time, but I think there are a number of things that the United States could do. Politically, though, I think it's just, we have a situation now that is very strange in the sense there is, on the one hand, sort of probably a deepening of commitment to nuclear weapons in the official ranks, if you will, happening um, because of Ukraine and nuclear threats from, uh, from Putin, but also because of where China is going. Um, but in the public discussion, there is a vastly increased concern about the threat from nuclear weapons. And so at some point in the future discussion, those two very polarized points of view will have to have a conversation uh, and figure out, are there steps that actually can be taken so we don't just sort of tumble on you know, nuclear deterrence autopilot from now on from this crisis? Thank you, Hans. And then Daryl to you for this question, and then we'll close out. Well, real quick, I think um, you know, the scenarios that we're looking at here, as Hans said, um, primarily involve the possibility of Russia using a tactical nuclear weapon or weapons in Ukraine. Uh, there's also the possibility if US and NATO forces get entangled with Russian forces, there could be conventional escalation that then could go nuclear. A no first use policy as advisable and wise as it would be, and I'm a strong supporter of no first use, uh, you know, it doesn't really answer the question, what should the United States do if tactical nuclear weapons are used against Ukraine, or if Russia, after NATO and Russian forces get entangled, uses nuclear weapons against the NATO territory. Um, so um, that is a conversation for another time. The immediate question is, how do we reduce uh, the, the risk of nuclear use here. How do we respond to these brazen nuclear threats, the likes of which we really have not seen in the post-Cold War era from uh, like this, from a Russian leader in the middle of a hot conflict? Um, the other thing I would just note is that, you know, Rose Gottmuller, who's very knowledgeable and I'm sure has seen some of the scenarios uh, and planning documents on these this kind of situation you know she noted that you know one of the things that nato and the united states might consider if russia used tactical nuclear weapons in ukraine would be a conventional targeted strike on the military facilities that launched that strike against ukraine um, that might make sense from a military standpoint a proportionality standpoint but i would just point out that that scenario itself would be extremely risky because it would invite, if not trigger, uh, further Russian counterattacks uh, because it would involve directly engaging Russian and NATO forces and US forces with Russian forces. So 
that leads me to what I was my 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 core point here is that all of the options following potential Russian nuclear weapons use in Ukraine are absolutely awful and would put the president of the United States, Secretary General Stoltenberg in an absolutely impossible situation. So we have to avoid getting to that point in the first place. And um, that begins with what we do beginning yesterday and today to dissuade the Russians from even thinking about this option. Thank you. And with that, we'll conclude today's event. A recording of the event, of, of, excuse me, a recording of the event will be on ACA's website later this week. And a last thank you very much to Daryl and Hans for joining us for today's discussion. And thanks to all our participants for the excellent questions. Take care.